So it is with much excitement that I would like to introduce today's host, uh, Peter Sokolowski, a lexicographer and editor at large at Merriam-Webster. Um, and he's going to be presenting on what online dictionary data tells us about the English language. Um, and as someone who has great personal interest in words and etymology in general, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he has to share. Um, so with that said, Peter, um, I'll pass it off to you and I'll be on the line if you have any questions. Well, thank you so much, Emily, and welcome to everybody. I feel a little funny talking without seeing you. And in fact, uh, I'm going to try to speak a little bit slowly and a little bit loudly. Both things are hard for me uh, to do. And partly that's because of where I work at, at the dictionary office uh, on the editorial floor, which is upstairs from here where we're speaking. Um, it's actually a silent environment. So we're used to working on the dictionary in almost total silence. It used to be a rule, um, and now it's sort of just a tradition. Our president, John Morris, says that writing dictionary definitions is kind of like the equivalent mentally of taking the SAT all day long. And uh, that sounds really not very fun at all, but in fact what he means is the level of concentration does require a, a certain amount of silence. And for the better part of 12 years, that was the environment in which I worked all the time. And lately, I've come out of the office a little bit from time to time, maybe met some of you um, at conferences to um, talk to educators and librarians and people who love language around the country and around the world. And um, because the quiet dictionary guy that I am has suddenly meets uh, the people who use dictionaries, I've had one encounter that sort of repeats itself over and over again. And that is that if I'm at, say, the Merriam-Webster dictionary booth at uh, a conference, or if I'm giving a lecture, or if I'm giving an interview, um, there's always somebody, and it almost really is literally every day that this happens, someone comes up to me and says, like in a kind of conspiratorial whisper, my family thinks I'm crazy because I read the dictionary. And What's interesting about that to me is that, of course, I'm one of you. I'm one of those people who grew up reading the dictionary and the encyclopedias and all that kind of thing. So my question to you, if you were all sitting in front of me, is how many of you also read the dictionary or when you were young would read the dictionary and surprise your family? And my point about that question is simply this. Um, people come up to me so frequently and tell me this story as though they are the only person they've ever heard of who actually reads the dictionary. And in my experience, um, in fact, many people read the dictionary. Uh, and in fact, this leads me to think that looking up a word in the dictionary is, is an intimate act. It's a private act. Nobody sees us do it, and nobody knows what word we're looking up. The reasons why we're looking up a word in the dictionary are so many and varied. But What's interesting to me about this too is that if you are a Red Sox fan, you can tell another Red Sox fan by looking at what baseball cap they're wearing. Or if you like um, knitting, you might be in a circle of people who are knitting. But if you like looking up words in the dictionary, if you actually read the dictionary for pleasure, um, maybe you're a strange person, but my contention is maybe you're not that strange after all. Um, and so I begin with that anecdote because I kind of want you to know that we're all in this together. We're going to talk about um, the data from the dictionary from two perspectives. One is what it tells us about language and specifically English, and also a little bit about what it tells us about um, online reference as a business because, of course, dictionaries for Merriam-Webster are also a business, and so I can't ignore that part of the story. Um, our first slide that you're looking at there is actually the, the uh, architect's rendering of our dictionary sculpture that is sitting above the front door of our building, and I just love the image. And I also love the fact that it's a book. And we are talking today about the online dictionary data, but of course it all starts originally with the dictionary itself, which was for Merriam-Webster and for most of us, a book first. The notion of having the dictionary as data means one thing to me that is primary in importance, and that is that the data flows both ways. On the one hand, you can look up any word in the dictionary. On the other hand, we now know which words are being looked up when, and then today we'll investigate a little bit as to why. So if we go back in time and look at, for example, Dr. Johnson. This is a picture of Samuel Johnson. I love this portrait, by the way, by Joshua Reynolds, who was a friend of Johnson's. Um, and I think this portrait is called the Squinting Johnson. Um, Dr. Johnson wrote in 1755 the great dictionary 
uh, in London, uh, the great, really first modern dictionary as we understand dictionaries today. Um, and just very briefly, what I mean by that is not only did he define hard words, uh, which was the job of dictionaries in the Renaissance, he defined all the words, simple words, household words, domestic words, and also uh, things like pronouns and function words that uh, were not part of early dictionaries. He defined those things. The second thing he did uh, was to give multiple definitions of the same word. This was kind of an original idea. It seems obvious to us today, but it makes his dictionary really uh, a product of the Enlightenment. Uh, kind of uh, thinking and organization. And finally, one thing that J Johnson did so well was to add sentences, example sentences from literature, notably from Shakespeare, but also all the great authors, to show how words were used. So Johnson is sort of the first great modern English lexicographer. But when I'm talking about data and feedback and how we know which words are being looked up, when you think back to Dr. Johnson or to Noah Webster who wrote the Great American Dictionary uh, about 50 years later, we have to think that he worked for a day, a week, or even a month on a difficult word, and he would never know if anybody ever looked that word up, if all of that work he put into writing a definition ever came to anyone's use or help. And so we do have one anecdote, however, of um, an encounter that Johnson had with uh, a society matron, someone in London, who congratulated him on the dictionary. And she said, Dr. Johnson, I'm so pleased that you have omitted the naughty words. To which Dr. Johnson replied, Madam, I find that you have been looking them up. And what, what's interesting to me about that story is that it's an example of negative evidence of a lookup. A lookup is what we call a single instance of a person looking up a word in the dictionary. In this case, he had evidence that a woman looked up the words to check that they weren't there. Um, and there's a kind of a, a parallel story uh, associated with the Oxford English Dictionary. And here's a picture of Dr. James Murray, the so-called professor, if you know The Professor and the Madman, a book about the uh, making of the Oxford English Dictionary. This is uh, Dr. Murray around 1900 uh, in, his, uh, in his scriptorium. You see all the bits of paper, the, uh, the, the quotations as they call them at the OED. There's a similar story there, an, uh, an instance of negative evidence of, uh, of a lookup, of interest in a word. Because uh, Dr. Murray wrote to a member of the Oxford University Medical College um, and asked if a certain word should be added to the new English dictionary. Uh, is this word a valuable English word or is it too specialized for people? And, am I too loud? And, um, the answer came back from the medical college that, uh, in fact, the word is too specialized. Only doctors would ever care about this word. Don't bother. Don't put it in the dictionary. Well, then a couple of years later, the queen died, that is to say Victoria, and there was a new king named. And the king suddenly fell ill. And in fact, he couldn't be coronated right away because he was so ill. And the problem was he was afflicted with the illness that was named by the word that was not put in the dictionary on the recommendation of the Oxford Medical College. So what we had here was the entire nation looking up a word that wasn't in the dictionary. The word was appendicitis. And needless to say, it's now in the English dictionary, in the Oxford English dictionary. So there we have two examples of curiosity about words or interest in words that were not met. But these are the kind of anecdotal uh, instances of of lookup data that we can have from the pre-digital age. When we move to the digital age, what we really are talking about is making the dictionary data. I love this little robot. This, this robot is actually in our marketing department and it was made for our, um, I believe it's the eighth uh, collegiate dictionary and I think it was the first um, uh, dictionary that had the word Android added to it. And so I love that they turned a dictionary into a little robot. So it's my, it's my cute reference to the dictionary as data. <clears throat> but um, when we make the dictionary data, uh, we change the way that we think and use the dictionary, think about the dictionary and use the dictionary. And I'll say a little bit more about this later, but I just want to say that um, the Collegiate Dictionary for Merriam-Webster is a big part of our business and was for the 20th century really the financial backbone of the company as the second uh, best-selling hardcover book in American history, second only to the Bible. So as you can guess, it was a very important title for us and one that we keep uh, very close, near and dear to our hearts. It's one that we update almost every year with new words. And it's a dictionary that you're probably familiar with. Um, 
And the idea of putting that dictionary online for free was a very surprising one to lots of people. They would say, why would you give away this engine of uh, economic success for your company? And uh, the answer is really twofold. On the one hand, we wanted to support the print dictionary by having it online. But really, our president, John Morris, told me what he had in mind was the simple fact that the, on, that the, the online world, people using the Internet, would want easy and quick and free access to a dictionary. And I have to emphasize, we're talking about 1996 here. This is before most of us had ever heard of Amazon or eBay for that matter. So we'll get back to what the business consequences of that decision were later. But let's look at that first uh, home page. This is from about the year 2000. Maybe some of you remember this home page. But the, co the Collegiate Dictionary contents were put online, and they were put online for free, as I said, in 1996. In 1997, we had a great sort of world news event. And some of you might recognize this. I think this is in front of Kensington Palace which was the residence of the, of the Prince and Princess of Wales, or actually was the residence of the Princess of Wales after the divorce, if, if I remember correctly. Obviously, we're talking about Princess Diana's death. And what we found was, even though the dictionary had been online for about a year, what we had noticed uh, in the data was a collection of words that are looked up every day of the year. Uh, you might call them evergreen words or constant words, and we're going to talk about those in a minute also. But when Princess Diana died, we noticed a sudden and, and, and really surprising change in the data, and that is that people suddenly looked up words related, relating to this news event. They looked up the words paparazzi for the photographers who were often blamed for the accident that caused her death. The word cortege was looked up in enormous numbers. Uh, on the day of her funeral. And of course, and, and the word princess was looked up. And I say of course, but that's actually kind of surprising because this is not what most of us consider to be a vocabulary word. It's not an SAT word. It's not the kind of word that people uh, normally have to look up in the dictionary, maybe for spelling. But um, what's interesting to me about that is that the plain words, the, the simple words, are often looked up in enormous numbers when they are given a very specific context. And we're going to see that over and over again. Sometimes a familiar word in an unfamiliar context makes that word seem strange. Uh, or it may be that people were looking up the word princess much the way we look up uh, uh, words for food or a recipe for salad. In other words, was she a princess by birth or only by marriage? What makes a princess? Is a princess higher than a duchess? Is a princess higher than a queen? Many, many of these questions are kind of what we might call encyclopedic questions, but they're answered by the definition of the word princess. It's just interesting to me to see that these are the words that were most curious uh, uh, to most people uh, looking up words uh, on, in the dictionary. I'm reminded of the fact that people called her, I believe it was Tony Blair who referred to uh, Princess Diana as the people's princess. And it may have been that little sound bite that sent people to the dictionary to say, well, what does that really mean? What does a princess really mean? If it doesn't refer to who she's married to, does, does it refer to something else, some kind of public role? And in fact, all of that is true. The next big um, news event uh, was September 11th. The fact is I've skipped over the Clinton impeachments, which actually saw all kinds of neat words being looked up as well. And again, because of the technical and legal and government nature of an indictment and an impeachment uh, and a, um, uh, a uh, what's the word when, uh, let's see, when the, when the Congress um, uh, makes an official uh, kind of uh, punishment to the to a president or a member, a censure. Thank you, censure. These are all words that were looked up during the Clinton impeachment. But then 9/11 happened, and September 11th was, uh, needless to say, a shock to everybody's system. And what the words were uh, after in that following week uh, are really surprising and and enlightening. You had immediately these concrete words of destruction and damage, rubble, and triage. And then you had these words of ideology and motive and fear, like terrorism and jingoism. These are words that were used in the press and used in conversations about the attacks. You also had these even broader and in some ways more poignant ideas like succumb and surreal. And surreal, this is really the first time that we had seen surreal, which has become kind of um, 
kind of a star word uh, that we find is looked up after disasters of many different kinds. And speaking as a dictionary editor, when I saw the word surreal spiking after 9-11, I said to myself, and this is really inside dictionary talk now, inside baseball, I said to myself, please, Lord, let not the dictionary definition of surreal be of or relating to surrealism. Because that's the kind of definition that isn't always really helpful when you're trying to clarify ideas and language. And so I did look up that definition. And let's look at that definition right now because I think it is kind of moving. Marked by the intense, irrational reality of a dream. And it also means unbelievable or fantastic. But the intense, irrational reality of a dream. Some colleague of mine wrote those words maybe 10 years ago, maybe 50 years ago, I'm not sure. But what a beautiful kind of poem for a dictionary definition. And, and I do find that that's the kind of definition that helps the most is when um, a little phrase brings clarity to what is an abstract idea. But there we have succumb to be brought to an end as death by the effective destructive or disruptive forces. This just tells me in some way what people are looking for when people look up a word in the dictionary. <clears throat> What's amazing to me is the curiosity of vocabulary that happened uh, after Michael Jackson's death. And in fact, as long as I've been looking at words uh, online and our data, this is the single greatest vocabulary event that we've seen. Michael Jackson's death was something that really riveted the world. And the words that were looked up tell the story of that weekend. Um, the first word that was looked up, and I remember seeing it spike on Saturday morning, it was stricken. And that was the news report. Finally, we had resuscitate. These were obviously unsuccessful attempts, but it was a word that really um, sent people to the dictionary. And then for the first time ever, the number one word, it was on Sunday, was RIP. The number one word uh, was an initialism or an acronym. Uh, that's the first time I've ever seen that in our dictionary data. RIP stand, standing for requiescat in pace in Latin or in English, rest in peace. Condolences uh, was the big word. And then icon became the most looked up word as the obituaries were printed. And finally, emaciated as news reports continued about the death of Michael Jackson and the condition uh, of his body, the reported condition of his body. Now, emaciated uh, strikes me as a word that most adults use and hear in the news in many contexts. But again, here it was used in such a specific way in a medical context about a very famous person who had had uh, maybe a, a medical history that was interesting to lots of people. And so the intensity of that word uh, and, uh, and the, um, the, uh, the strict uh, sort of medical definition of that word sent people to the dictionary, not only making it the most looked up word of that week of Michael Jackson's death, but the week of July 2009, and indeed the whole summer of 2009, making it the number two word uh, for the year of 2009, the second most looked up word of the year. So we can see that Michael Jackson's death really drove a lot of traffic. Now, there are other things that drive traffic, like recent news events. And I wish I could hear all of you, uh, I, I wish I could hear some of you chuckling about this particular graph. This is one of the uh, graphs that I use to monitor the, the data for the dictionary. And I bet you can guess uh, what October 12th this was. This was October uh, 11th or 12th of 2012 when uh, Vice President Joe Biden used the word malarkey uh, twice, I believe, during uh, the vice presidential debate. And uh, that's kind of a fun word, and it was a word that uh, got a lot of notice, and he used it in the vice presidential debate. There's another way to look at this data, and this is our daily lookups, but here's the hourly um, lookups. And you can see uh, here's the word wonk, which is a word used to describe Paul Ryan on TV quite often. And you see the word condescending was looked up a lot too. Condescending uh, was a word used by a lot of the press to describe uh, Joe Biden's attitude toward Paul Ryan. So we see that people were following the news with their laptops or their iPhones or smartphones right with them, and they were looking up words as the news happened. Here's another way to look at this. This is the hourly uh, measure of the morning after. So we see here at 8 or 9 a.m. on the following day, that is to say the day after the pr vice presidential debate, and you see that malarkey dipped in the overnight hours, and then as people returned home to, wo uh, returned to work, um, looked up the word. And so we can see these patterns in terms of frequency. And then you see wonky and wonk were both looked up in great uh, numbers um, uh, as a consequence of that debate. So these are kind of the raw numbers 
Here's another example of that. This, fall, this, is, uh, this past March, uh, March 26, um, just after the uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision concerning the Defense of Marriage Act and uh, the California uh, gay marriage ban. And so we see in this case the, the word marriage, you know, relative to other words, was uh, looked up very, very frequently. Now marriage is a special case because the legal and political questions about marriage have everything to do with its definition. That's not true for other political hot button terms like abortion, for example. There's no controversy about what abortion means even though abortion is a legal and political controversial subject. So with marriage we have a special case. We have a, a, um, a um, a word that um, refers specifically to something that also has legal and political ramifications and therefore gets an enormous amount of attention in the dictionary. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that we've noticed in the last few years, especially the last decade, as gay marriage has become legal increasingly in America. But forget all that stuff. The two most commonly looked up words in the English language don't have to do with the news necessarily, but with the language like affect and effect. If you were to take uh, a poll of our dictionary data um, daily, going all the way back to the beginning, I have no doubt that affect and effect are the two most looked up words. And this isn't really for spelling and it's not for definition, it's for what we call usage. Obviously this is a huge usage issue. It's very difficult for native speakers of English. I can promise you it's very difficult for non-native speakers of English to use these two words well. Um, and, you know, broadly speaking, the problem here is that they share pronunciations almost identically and that they both function as both nouns and verbs. However, um, just since we're on the subject, um, it, we can broadly say that um, affect, as I say with an A, is most commonly seen as a verb and effect with an E is most commonly seen as a noun. And of course, uh, effect, that is to say with an E as a verb, is only used in that spe specialized transitive sense, so sort of to effect change. Um, and affect as a noun um, is pretty specialized also, usually referring to the psychological um, um, consequences of facial expression. So uh, that's a confusing usage issue and a bugaboo of English and it gets looked up all the time. Here are some of the words that are looked up almost every single day. These words change very slowly over time. Um, but they tend to remain consistent, um, pragmatic, ubiquitous, conundrum, paradigm, integrity, and insidious. You notice that these all have Greek or Latin roots, classical roots. They're either classical words or pseudo-classical words in the case of conundrum, which we believe uh, maybe looks like Latin but was probably or possibly made up by undergraduates uh, at Oxford or Cambridge in the 18th century who wanted to make up a word that looked like a Latin word. But Nevertheless, it's today understood, broadly speaking, to look like a classical word. And these are words that often refer to sort of abstract ideas like integrity. Um, and integrity is one of the most looked up words in our uh, dictionary on a daily basis and has been for years. Now one thing that we see uh, in the dictionary is a certain kind of seasonal or specialized term. And one of my favorites is that right around Valentine's Day, the word love is looked up um, and by, far, at, at by far the most. It, it becomes the number one word usually for a day or two. But the fact is the word love is always pretty high in the lookups, remarkably high considering how common the word is to the language and how basically fundamentally simple it is both grammatically and uh, orthographically. And so it really raises the question, why do people look up the word love in the dictionary? It's not for spelling. Um, it's not for pronunciation. And I find this to be kind of an interesting question. And I really do think that people who read the dictionary, people like you and me perhaps, are people who look to dictionary definitions sometimes for philosophical reasons. And um, I think this is supported by one anecdote, one little piece of evidence that I have. And that is a letter that was written to our editorial department uh, about this word. And let's take a look at that letter right now. <coughs> Dear blank, we thank you for your letter, but your question about how long love lasts is not something we can answer. We lexicographers are good at defining words. Questions about the nature and permanence of deeply felt human emotions, though, are a little outside our field. We're sorry not to be more helpful. Sincerely, Stephen J. Peralt. So our um, 
Right. Our, uh, our editor, Stephen Peralt, who is now our um, editor-in-chief functionally, his title is a wonderful one, by the way. His title is Director of Defining, which I think is a really cool title. But he wasn't, he wasn't being facetious with this letter. He was being quite serious. But it is kind of funny, and it does show that people write in to the dictionary with these sort of deep philosophical questions that are sometimes beyond uh, what a dictionary can really answer, because we are really addressing what a word means um, and what a word describes, not the phenomenon or the idea, but the word that labels that phenomenon or names that idea. And that's a neat kind of lesson to learn, and, and we can see that this uh, letter was written, as I perceive, uh, just about two weeks before I started work here at the company, because <laughs> today is my 19th anniversary. We also see lately uh, a little competition, um, a little competition in terms of spelling. We see that the word camaraderie, which is usually spelled in the French way, this, this, this lower spelling is the traditional spelling camaraderie. But we see this other, this variant, this lesser known variant pronunciation, which is seen a certain amount. It's seen enough for us to include it in the dictionary. Um, it's looked up all the time, and we realize that uh, as happened in the 16th and the 17th century, there was often competition between multiple spellings of a word, and, and often uh, that competition would be settled uh, over time. But what, what's interesting to me about this is that it's like we're back in those days uh, before mass communications and even mass literacy when there was, there was actual competition um, in the spelling of a word. And it may be that if the, uh, the uh, more phonetic spelling is a word, is a spelling that we find more frequently occurring in, uh, in carefully edited and serious places, that it may be a word, uh, spelling that becomes more acceptable to a greater number of people. For the moment though, as always, I would stick with, um, I would stick with the tried and true pronunciation, uh, the tried and true spelling of this word. Um, just for your interest, because I did this research, I looked at this, these homophones, or the words that sound alike, there, there, and there. And I checked them over a period of a day, and a week, and a month, and a year, and I found that the, the relative frequency was always the same. That the, the there that people look up the most is the one that has the possible misspelling of E and I. Not, not very surprising. Um, but then people do sometimes compare it or look up with other ones. And people do look up these basic, simple words. Sometimes uh, we have words that are looked up on the, on the dictionary, and we have no idea why they were looked up. Um, it might take a day or sometimes a week or longer before I can ever find out why. Um, I can remember um, there was one incident when the phrase après moi le déluge was looked up. Uh, and, and it was the number one word for days and days. And we finally discovered that uh, David Gergen, the presidential advisor and uh, the news commentator, I think who works for CNN now, um, he wrote an essay and it was put at CNN.com and he used the phrase après moi le déluge uh, which means after me the flood, uh, and it's a, a phrase attributed to the French King Louis the Fifteenth. Um, and uh, he linked it, or CNN linked it directly to our dictionary uh, online, and that showed us a certain kind of way that the online economy functions. That is to say, through links that people can um, can make your website kind of uh, uh, ring or light up with uh, with hits um, by their own use and linking. But sometimes we see words, for example, like huskau. Here's this word huskau, which is sort of a funny word that means jail. And, um, uh, and this word happened, as you can see, this was a Sunday evening. I was working in a cafe, and here it is. It was 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night, and it spiked. And so I, I tweeted uh, a question. I said, did somebody just say huskau on television? And sure enough, there was a Sunday night football game, and Al Michaels, was the, was the uh, commentator, the color commentator. And what happened was a streaker ran across the football field. And of course, that stops the game. And police had to arrest this streaker and carry him off the field before the game could continue. Now, speaking, if we think about Al Michaels as a broadcaster, we have to realize that this is kind of a funny event, but he had to fill the time. He had to talk. And so what he said was, they're going to carry that guy off to the Huskow. They're going to bring him to jail. And what we also found is that we had evidence of Al Michaels using that word, Huskow, in the past as well. So we, we see that um, just uh, from um, paying attention to pop culture, to sports, to television, we see what drives people to the dictionary. Bill O'Reilly drives people to the dictionary in enormous numbers. In fact, this week, one of the most looked up words 
Uh, in fact, number one for yesterday is a word that he used on his TV show. We'll look at that a little bit later. This word, for example, snollygoster, whenever I see that word spike um, on, our, um, on our data, I know that Bill O'Reilly said it uh, during his show. And as you can see, he even has this, web, this page on his website dedicated to vocabulary. Now there is a seasonal um, function to vocabulary as well. And we're about at back to school time right now. And this is from last year. And uh, if you look at this data for the word culture, just the word culture, we see that it, it is looked up on a kind of a flat line in August and then it spikes in September. These dips, by the way, represent weekends. And we have seen this pattern year in and year out that the word culture is the big word in back to school, that the word culture is part of so many course names and textbooks. And, and frankly, it's a kind of an abstract and difficult word. I mean, if you use it in a phrase like West African culture, that's fairly clear. But what about a title of a course called Culture Through Film? Um, or you know, is conformism uh, and racism and culture, are these uh, parallel terms? Or does culture sort of embrace the other two? And culture just becomes one of those words that I, I think um, it becomes sort of a, 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 a word of an abstract nature that college students have to address and use because their professors do. And we see that that spike in the word culture usually lasts about a month. Now there are some uh, words that are looked up by virtue of where they're looked up from. And by that I mean from a mobile device or a smartphone. We do have, uh, uh, by the way, an app for that. This um, Merriam-Webster app is free. <laughs> I, 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 I recommend it to everyone, and the dictionary works great as a mobile app. Uh, I mean as, a, as, a, as, a, as an app and as a mobile app if you use it um, uh, through a browser. But um, what we found is, for example, there are spikes of certain words that come very late at night. Uh, and there's one word in particular that shows up late at night that indicates to me that people are either in a bar or in bed. Uh, that is to say they're no longer at their desk or in their office and they're looking up words and the word is a funny one. It's chi, this odd word that is a huge favorite among Scrabble and words with friends players. This is a word that people use and uh, look up and make sure it's a real word while they're playing Scrabble. And they often play it late at night. In fact, I saw the pattern on Christmas afternoon when there's a total suppression of school traffic and also a total suppression of business traffic to the website. The words chi, QI and ZA, spelled Z-A, which is short for pizza, is a somewhat controversial word in the world of Scrabble, but it is in the dictionary and therefore playable. Um, those are the two most looked up words on Christmas afternoon. So we know that people were playing Scrabble uh, with their friends and family on Christmas afternoon. Now, uh, there is a, a spot on our homepage uh, at MarianWebster.com called Trend Watch. Um, and that highlights the most looked up word or the most interesting word that spiked during the previous week. And so we can see here, for example, if you're familiar with, uh, if you're online a lot, and you might have seen last week the, uh, the huge kerfuffle about the word literally, which went viral from Reddit to Facebook to Twitter and into many uh, online articles, uh, including this one, this one um, on our website, about the, the word literally and its uh, so-called figurative use, as in he literally died laughing. The week before that, the word asylum from when uh, Edward Snowden was granted asylum uh, in, in Russia. Before that, the word esoteric was used uh, by Chris Christie to describe, um, uh, to describe potential, um, potential rivals for the Republican nomination. The word before that was moniker, and that, uh, of course, is a word for name, and that was looked up because the new royal baby was named during that week. And this is kind of a journalist word, a journalist's favorite. Journalists love this kind of word because if you use the word name over and over again in an article, it gets boring. So that they like to use words that are synonyms like this. Um, another word that gets looked up a lot is the word mercurial. And journalists love that word mercurial. It, it, it appeared in the obituaries, for example, of both Steve Jobs and uh, Gaddafi last year. Um, it's a favorite word. Pariah, uh, that was uh, a word used by uh, George Zimmerman's lawyer. Kafkaesque happened uh, because I believe Google's doodle was on Kafka's birthday. Um, coup d'etat was, needless to say, very sadly uh, to this day, uh, so much unrest in Egypt. And argle bargle was the uh, unusual phrase used by Supreme Court Justice 
Scalia. So we can see that um, on a weekly basis, we really get a colorful picture and snapshot of the English language um, at our homepage. But I emphasize that on our homepage, we also have the list of the most popular words um, listed by the day, by the week, and also by the quarter. So you can see which words are being used. All, all you have to do is go to merriamwebster.com and you'll see those lists. And then um, you can go to our unabridged site if you're a subscriber to Merriam-Webster Unabridged. You also see those words, words that are looked up in the unabridged dictionary as opposed to the um, online dictionary. There's also a, a neat thing, a, a new thing to our website, which I love, which is the popularity meter. When you look up a word, you can see a little meter that shows you um, in what percentile that word falls uh, in terms of its popularity uh, as a lookup. So let's conclude here by looking at the books again and going back to that story of putting the dictionary online because it was a risk. It was, it was a big risk. Um, if our business was selling books, what business was it for, of ours to give the content away, to make the book available for free as, uh, as a dictionary? And here's the problem. Here is the bet. Here is the risk. If people gave the dictionary as a gift, as you see here in, in the old days, we, we always had a, a gift uh, presentation page in the dictionary. And, and I bet a lot of you have a Merriam-Webster Collegiate Dictionary with a page like this, and maybe you got it for high school graduation. Uh, many people tell me they did. I know I did. Um, if people buy that book and make it, make it a bestseller throughout the 20th century and give it away as a gift, that's one thing. But what if that book is then put on a shelf and left there? That's the big risk because if no one looks up words in the dictionary, then we would be sunk as a business online. But if people take the book off the shelf, if people open the dictionary, if people read the dictionary, then not only do we have a new model for online reference, but we have a new business model as well. And so today we have over a billion page views on that dictionary website, which is generating the advertising revenue that pays for our staff and our independence, the fact that we can continue to produce dictionaries as we've been doing since 1847. And so that's how I conclude this story, which is to say that online dictionary data, it works for um, both the user and the producer of dictionaries. So now I'd love to know more about what you'd like to know about the dictionary. Thanks. So I'm going to take a, a, a breath here. <laughs> Thanks, Peter, so much. This has been really, really interesting. Um, I have seen there are a couple questions that have come in um, during uh, the first uh, during your presentation so far. Um, one person had a question when you were showing the different graphs um, of how frequently uh, words are looked up online, and they asked, "How do the words go into the negative access on the graph?" Oh, some of them appear to dip uh, below below the zero. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. I assume that's, what, I assume that's what's meant. People have asked me that question before. I don't have a good answer for that. I think it basically means from prior to the time period shown. In other words, the dictionary is basically a long tail of data, kind of like if you think about Amazon.com as having all the titles of all the books. The best-selling books are the ones that get sold maybe once every minute. Um, the least selling books are maybe sold once every five years. And so we have words in the dictionary that are only looked up uh, once every five months or every, every five years. And often those words that we see um, on the charts weren't looked up too much uh, last week or, or yesterday or last month. And it may be that um, those, they, they, they're simply coming up from a position that isn't measurable from that page. The other thing that I don't know if you noticed on those um, charts, they, I, they only show 10 words at a time. So I'm only looking at the I'm, I'm skipping back now so that we can take a look. Um, you can see, hang on, uh, if I, you can see um, that in this case, we're only looking at a 24-hour period. So all that means is that prior to that 24-hour period, it dipped below um, the baseline for the top 10 words. So I think that's the basic answer for that one. I, I, hope, I hope that makes sense to you. Yeah, that made uh, perfect sense. Um, we do have a couple other people ask this, and I was actually interested to know this as well. Um, is there a way to search the Merriam-Webster website uh, to see the frequency of word searches? And is this data that you guys have um, publicly available in any sort of form? Well, sure. I mean, for, I, I think I can show you. Uh, if, I, if I reduce my screen here to the, to the dictionary, um, 
I'm going to actually open up the, the, uh, the dictionary and take a look at it. Um, we, the, the actual the, the data um, graphs that I showed you are proprietary, but if you go to our home page, we do show um, down, if you, you simply scroll down, there's something here called most popular. And I can click on this, and that will show you the words that are being looked up. And so in this case, here we have the most popular words, and the number one word, jackdance, or jacktance, was the word that Bill O'Reilly used last night on TV. Um, and we see some of these evergreen words like pragmatic and paradigm. We see words like aesthetic, and down here, here it is, culture, words that are associated with back to school um, that were looked up. Pardon me. And uh, then if we look at the last week's words, we can see that Bill O'Reilly's word from yesterday jumped all the way to the top of the whole week's lookups. We can see that the whole literally controversy put this in the top 10 of words for the last week. And, so, and then you can see the last quarter of words. And you can see, for example, words like socialism, uh, which was our word of the year this past year, a word that was looked up frequently during the presidential election along with capitalism. So this is the best way to see that data. And as I also mentioned, if we, if we were to click on a word uh, to see its dictionary definition, um, and I go past the ads, um, you'll see a You'll see, yeah, you'll see a, a popularity meter which says it's in the top 1% of lookups. So if I pop over to our unabridged website, here's the unabridged, and may, maybe many of you have a subscription to the unabridged website. And I will very quickly give a plug to the fact that there's a blog here at our unabridged website that is outside the paywall. So you can read our articles at the blog, articles by me and my colleagues Corey Stamper and Emily Brewster, and guest bloggers. Um, uh, from the world of academics and linguistics and, um, and, and, and writing. But here we have the most looked up words for the unabridged dictionary. And this is, as you see, a nice clean page. Um, and uh, we show the top 25 words. So that's how we present the data to the public. Oh, by the way, I should also mention, um, I report on the data on Twitter. If you follow me on Twitter, um, it's just my name. It's at Peter Sokolowski. Um, uh, this is really my number one job on Twitter. I find it um, kind of interesting to look at spikes in interest in, 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 in language. And sometimes uh, in a very intense event such as a presidential debate or the Boston Marathon bombings, I actually tweet by the hour to show which words are looked up in what order um, by the hour. And I, I'm very gratified to say that Time Magazine called my Twitter feed one of the best of the year this year for this reason, because journalists and people interested in language um, have found it kind of interesting to see uh, the news through the optic of language or see language through the prism of the news. Yeah, I can totally vouch for that uh, for your Twitter feed, Peter. It's, it's really fascinating. And to everyone who um, registered for the webinar, we are going to include all of that information, the link to the blog, the link to Peter's Twitter feeds, um, all in that follow-up email. So you, if you didn't catch it today, you can always um, follow him in a couple days when we send out the follow-up email. Um, there was a really interesting question, and I'm definitely interested to hear your thoughts on this. Um, one person asked, what are your thoughts on the word literally, since we've talked about um, the viral uh, discussion of it last week. Um, what are your thoughts on the word literally now meaning figuratively as well? It rubs a lot of people the wrong way. Right. This is a really good question because I think it opens up a good solid way of thinking about uh, about how language works. Because first and foremost, the only constant in language is change. Language always evolves. It always does change. That's important. And let's look at literally in two different ways. We can look at it from the perspective of rhetoric, and we can look at it from the perspective of its etymology. So from the perspective of rhetoric, let's just remind ourselves that we're talking about a, an adverb here. And lots of adverbs are used rhetorically in hyperbolic contexts for exaggeration or emphasis. So for example, you could say something is blazingly obvious. And that doesn't mean that it's something that is actually smoking or on fire. You can say that um, uh, it is brutally hot today. And that does not mean that I get bruised or kicked by the heat or the humidity. And you can say someone is stunningly attractive. And it doesn't mean that you are physically knocked over. Um, so in other words, I think hyperbole is different from error. That's the first point. 
The second point is that literally, as we say in our little article here, has been used from the time of Charles Dickens and Charlotte Bronte and even Mark Twain um, to, uh, to uh, be a hyperbolic reference. So you could say, for example, I literally died laughing, and no one would misunderstand you. They would understand that you're emphasizing uh, what you're saying. The problem comes when you use hyperbole in a sloppy way, when it's not so obvious perhaps that um, you're trying to be uh, funny or, or you're trying to exaggerate. I do like our definition of literally in our learner's dictionary the, the, at learnersdictionary.com, which I really um, I do recommend to you because this, these are de de different definitions that are written for non-native speakers of English, and so they offer more usage advice. And so here, as you'll see, it says informal, used in an exaggerated way to emphasize a statement or description that is not literally true or possible. So the group literally poured out new ideas. Um, she was literally beside herself. But now let's look at our definition um, in, in the dictionary, in the, in the uh, online dictionary, because there's a usage note there that really uh, helps with this. Um, uh, and because this is such a common question. Here's the usage note right here. Whoops. <laughs> Hang on. I just lost it. Here it is. Um, yes. Since some people take sense 2 to be the opposite of sense 1, it has been frequently criticized as a misuse. Instead, the use is pure hyperbole intended to gain emphasis, but it often appears in contexts where no additional emphasis is necessary. That's the important point because that can seem sloppy. The problem is the etymology of literally comes from the Greek word liter, which means letter. In other words, it means by the letter. Uh, so the fact is when you say literally and, and you use it in its uh, first or more serious sense, um, everyone understands that to mean by the letter, um, very specifically. And then when you use this broader sense, which we, trans which we transcribe as in effect or virtually, you'll notice we don't use the word figuratively. Um, we use virtually to, to, for this meaning. Um, that becomes slightly informal, and it's uh, something that you should use with care. I will also emphasize, emphasize that if you're curious about this, we have a wonderful two-minute video on this subject uh, that uh, my colleague uh, Emily Brewster made. It's a wonderful video that gives you sort of the whole um, history of this controversy and also uh, some good usage advice. Um, and if you know our videos, you'll know that, um, that uh, this, is, this is a really fun way to learn. It's a two-minute video. So my basic uh, comment is that this is nothing new. Um, Merriam-Webster added this usage of literally in 1909, so it's nothing new to, to, um, to us in the dictionary world. But if you're writing serious prose or a business letter or a paper for academic use, um, maybe you should be very careful of that use of literally and make sure that you are presenting yourself in, in the way that you want to be uh, understood. And to be honest, that's true with all language, isn't it? We're always judged by the words that we use and how we use them. This literally um, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, trend came last week, I think, from a Reddit post that then went to Facebook and then went to Twitter and then went to all these other news sources. And some of them were pretty ill-informed, um, saying that this is a brand new sense and dictionaries have um, killed the English language. And that's not true at all. Our job is to reflect the truth of the English language and not to um, tell you this is right and this is wrong, but rather to tell you how the language is used and also how it's evolved. And so by the way, when you look at our definition of literally, notice that the first definition is the oldest one, and that's the one that most people are taking to be correct. Peter, that was a brilliant response um, and absolutely um, fascinating to hear from someone who is so knowledgeable on uh, language. There is another um, couple more questions that have come in. Um, one person asked, do you keep track of the most common misspellings of words that have been searched? That's a great question. And the answer, and the short answer is no, because at the moment my data is really keyed to successful page views, which means that the, the page has to exist. And if it's a misspelling, um, we don't have a page for that word. Uh, now, if I drill down, the answer is yes. I can go to our data um, in the analytics and see those misspellings. And you do see that people have trouble with spelling. But one thing that's great about our, um, our home page is that it, it, will, it will find the words for you. If you misspell something, it will uh, give you suggestions, and it's a really smart engine. Um, that will help you get there. Um, and so, th so the fact is I, I don't actually have I, – I, that's a really good question, and I need to do some research about that. And there's another one that I looked up uh, briefly um, about um, six months ago, and I have to do – this is 
now you're reminding me, it's a really good question, um, the most looked up pronunciations. In other words, which of our pronunciations, which are all spoken out loud, some of them by my voice, by the way, um, which of those are clicked on the most? And uh, the fact is um, that would be a really interesting subject. So I don't have a solid answer for you. I do want to say that we have a, a home page for Spanish, um, um, the, the Spanish dictionary and the Spanish language, and it's called Spanish Central. Um, and just so you know, there's a bilingual dictionary right there that is a really great bilingual dictionary, Spanish English. And as you see, it also gives the data much as we do for those words that are looked up in Spanish. So just in, in case any of you are interested, I, I, did, I did see one question from a Spanish teacher. Um, you should know that we have um, a nice uh, website for uh, Spanish speakers learning English or English speakers learning Spanish as well. Wonderful. Um, another person asked, uh, does Merriam-Webster sell their dictionary definitions to third parties? For instance, my Kindle app allows me to tap a word with my finger to get the definition. Do those definitions come from Merriam-Webster? And I'd li also like to ask that, if they don't come from Merriam-Webster, do you have any idea where they do come from? Is, is there one? No. Yes. There, there are some e-books. Our e-books are available on Kindle. The automated dictionary, my understanding, in Kindle is not a Merriam-Webster dictionary. The automated dictionary in the Nook is a Merriam-Webster dictionary. Um, okay. So that's really worth it's really worth checking. Um, of course, now you're entering the world of licensing and digital business, um, and I'm, I'm just a, I just write dictionaries, so I don't I don't know everything about the business side of these things. But that's a really good question. When you um, load something, for example, on your smartphone, you know you should um, look around and see which dictionary is the best one. Um, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a big fan of our free app because not only does it work uh, well when you're not online, that is to say, it it, it loads the dictionary so that you get you know really instantaneous. Uh, lookups even when you don't have good connections. But when you do have a good connection, you can get the audio. In other words, you can hear the word pronounced, but you can also speak the word into the phone uh, to get that word's definition. And let me tell you, that's a great feature. Um, just, I know that we only have a few minutes left. Um, I don't want to keep anyone really past the 2 o'clock time frame. Um, just one or two more questions for you, Peter. This is probably a broad question, um, but one person asked, how do you see um, the English language changing? And I know that you could probably talk uh, for an extended period of time about that, but if you do have any general thoughts um, or feedback on that, we'd love to hear it. I, I'm sorry, you're, um, you, you're, you, you said what, what the, how, the, how the language is changing. As a consequence of, of, of technology, do you mean? Um, it was, the person just simply asked, how do you see the language changing? But if you want to talk uh, specifically in relation to technology, you can certainly do that. Right, right. Well, that's a, that, I mean, that's a part of it for sure. I mean, obviously communication is so much faster than it used to be. When you think of Shakespeare's time um, to our time, uh, you know, just you know, the speed of communication is, is so much radically quicker now. Um, the, um, the, 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 the example of Shakespeare is a good one too because some of us have trouble reading Shakespeare. You know, if you say, um, wherefore art thou Romeo, um, what does wherefore mean? It, you know, wherefore doesn't mean where are you, it means why are you? You know, and if um, in Much Ado About Nothing there's a line, we here attend thee, it doesn't mean we are attend to you, it means we're waiting for you. Um, and so what we, we can see is the language evolving right before our eyes. Um, my concept about this is that the English language changes just fast enough that we notice. So one of the most controversial words for Webster's third interna new international dictionary in 1961, our unabridged dictionary when that was released, was very controversial. One of the most criticized words in that dictionary was a word that I bet no one would blink at today. The word was finalize. Um, finalize is a word that I think all of us agree is perfectly uh, good English today, and it was viewed as a kind of barbarism in 1961. Now, for me personally, I noticed the, wor the word impact as a verb, um, and that kind of rubs me the wrong way, and so I don't use it. Now, I don't say that you shouldn't use it. I just say that for me, when, when I grew up, I didn't use impact as a verb, and now I notice it that way. 
Um, and my point being that English changes just fast enough that we notice, which means that over 400 years, for example, since the time of Shakespeare, we notice a lot of changes. And that is always going to be the case. Any li living language will evolve. In terms of technology, um, people who are afraid that texting or IMing will ruin the language, I think that's ridiculous because uh, it, it, that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is think of how much more communication is text-based, is written today than um, just 10 or 20 years ago. So many more emails, so many more meetings um, uh, happen uh, online and through writing. And therefore, just as we're all judged by our speech and the words that we choose when we talk, and maybe the accent that we use or the pronunciation, we're also judged by our usage uh, uh, in, as writers. You, know, um, you better make sure that you've got the correct your uh, or the correct their or the correct its um, or, or somebody's going to correct you and judge you and tell you you're wrong. And um, I don't think that's my job, by the way. I just want to uh, make sure that everyone knows that um, you've got to be careful when you're presenting yourself in a verbal medium, which is what most of the Internet is. So basically, the bottom line is language always changes. You can tell partly because we add about 100, year, 100 words a year to the dictionary. Um, and so you can see that new words are being added all the time. I mean, a word like, I don't know, Bitcoin might be a, a one that comes up. Um, one of the recent words that I love a lot is um, um, uh, uh, the gastropub. I just love the word gastropub. And it, and it just conveys something new. Um, and sometimes words that are new that annoy people aren't as new as they think. For example, the word ginormous, which annoyed so many older people when it was added to our dictionary a couple of years ago uh, because it's perceived as the language of young teenagers in America, probably wouldn't annoy a, a British person because it was uh, soldier slang right after the period of World War II. So the people who use the word ginormous in England mostly have white hair. The people who use ginormous in America are mostly young teenagers. And so basically the word has carried a slightly different, um, uh, slightly different cultural meaning across the pond, uh, but uh, that's a wonderful way to observe the language is just keep watching it grow. And uh, I, that's what I love to do. You know, there's, there's no reason to think that because language is changing that standards are eroding. In other words, good writing is always good writing. That is um, a fantastic point to wrap up today's webinar. I saw that there were a couple other questions. I'm sorry that we won't be able to address all of them today. Um, we are just about out of time. But you can always reach uh, Peter on Twitter if you need to. Um, and we are going to send out all of that information in the follow-up email. Peter, thank you so, so, so much for a really, really interesting um, presentation today. It's something that's a little different from what we usually present during our PD webinars, but I know that everyone uh, who is participating today really enjoyed it. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who took the time uh, to come out to today's webinar. Uh, keep an eye out in your inbox. We will be sending certificates of completion as well as um, additional resources and the webinar recording for you to share as well. Um, so with that note, thank you everyone. And um, we did just release the uh, next four or five dates uh, for our ongoing professional development webinar series. Um, so please, uh, you can find all that information on our Twitter and Facebook pages if you'd like to attend future sessions. Um, and thanks again to you, Peter and Megan. It's been a, a real pleasure working with both of you. Thank you, Emily, and thank you everybody for listening in. Thanks everyone. Uh, we'll be signing off. If you have any more questions, you can always find us uh, on Twitter and Facebook. And we hope to see you at another upcoming PD webinar. Have a good one. <laughs>